Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about the origins and evolution of the First Amendment. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. We serve journalists in the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. Journalists and the First Amendment are taking a beating. We're under almost constant attack by the President of the United States, and animosity against the media has poisoned public discourse. It's a good time to step back and remind us all about the origins and evolution of the First Amendment. With me in the studio today are Lata Knott, Executive Director of the Museum Institute's First Amendment Center, and Stephen Wormiel, a former journalist and now a professor at the American University Washington College of Law. So thank you both for joining us today. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So why are we discussing the importance of the First Amendment today? It's because of the unrelenting attacks on the news media and freedom of the press by the president and many others. Uh, we've got a cartoon here by Nate Beeler of the Columbus Dispatch uh, showing the president and his opinion of the First Amendment. And it turns out that most Americans uh, don't know very much about the First Amendment and why it matters. So we have a cartoon from Walt Handelsman of The Advocate to illustrate that problem. So let's go back to basics, Stephen Latta. Why did the Founding Fathers decide the Constitution itself was not sufficient? Well, it's one of the things that I think people don't understand about the, the way the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment emerged. Um, basically, the Constitution wasn't going to be ratified. The, there was a concern by the Republicans or Anti-Federalists, as they were known, that the, the national government would have too much power and they weren't going to go along with ratifying the Constitution. And they insisted that there be a Bill of Rights as the price for their support. And the Federalists, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, basically did the math and said, we think we need their votes, and so we're going to go ahead and, and have a Bill of Rights. And um, the First Amendment was not actually the first, it turns out. There were originally actually 13 amendments introduced, uh, and the, the first two were not ratified at the time. One was about the, the size and shape of congressional districts. The second one, curiously, later became the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. It was about Congress not raising its own pay during the same session of Congress. It sat on the books for couple of hundred years and eventually enough states had ratified it and it became the 27th Amendment. But the First Amendment moved up to its first place when the other two were not approved. Interesting factoid. So Lata, why was James Madison considered the father of the First Amendment? Well, he drafted it uh, along with most of the amendments in the Bill of Rights. Um, but another thing is that uh, he drafted it, he understood its importance, and also you know, you, I think people forget uh, when the Founding Fathers were contemplating the Bill of Rights, um, previously in England, um, seditious libel was a crime. And seditious libel does not just mean that things that you say about someone that are false. They could also be insulting things that you said about the king or government officials that were true. In fact, if the facts were true, that could actually make it a worse crime because true insults are the worst insults of all, actually. <laughs> um, so that was the baseline that the Founding Fathers were working with. And so um, when they drafted the First Amendment, you have to consider that um, after living under that reign and under that kind of regime, they, it was very important to them that people be able, uh, were able to especially criticize the government. That I think they saw as the highest function of speech, to be a watchdog on the government. Mm -hmm. And what do you think was the intent of the, um, of the writers of the First Amendment toward the media itself? 
Well, I think uh, Thomas Jefferson, and correct me, I, I will probably mess up this quote, but he said that if you had to choose between a government without newspapers and newspapers without a government, he'd choose the latter every time. It was so important to him that the press be there to serve as a watchdog on the government for people to be able to criticize the government and observe what the government was doing. I mean, there was a lot, there were a lot of newspapers, there was a robust press, a lot of it was partisan, but, but you know, they were not in a, coming from an environment of a kind of sedate media, they were coming from an environment in which the media was, was roguish and, and uh, loud and, and intrusive, and, and, you know, they thought that was fine. Mm -hmm. So the First Amendment was ratified. And was there any activity surrounding the First Amendment in those early years until we got to the Sedition Act? Not really. Um, it, it's important to rem remember that the idea of or, or, or the significance of judicial review of the Supreme Court ruling on the actions of the states and, and of the federal government didn't really come into to full play until 1803 with Marbury versus Madison. And even then, it was another hundred years before the Supreme Court sort of started regularly um, reviewing acts of Congress. So we didn't have a culture of, uh, you're violating my rights, I'm going to court. That, that didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the Alien and Sedition Act. So the Sedition Act, particularly of 1798, um, as Lada said, sort of goes totally counter to what we thought we understood the framers were, were trying to do. The Sedition Act made it a crime to bring uh, ridicule upon the president or Congress, punishable by prison or, or fines or both. In fact, about 20 people were prosecuted, um, including newspaper editors and a member of Congress. It was highly partisan. The, the Sedition Act was passed by a Federalist Congress, the John Adams side of things, and it was used to prosecute the Republicans or Jeffersonians. Um, the Jeffersonians argued in Congress that it clearly would violate the First Amendment, but that argument didn't prevail. The Sedition Act expired when Adams' presidency ended and Jefferson became president wasn't renewed, and then Jefferson pardoned them all and arranged for Congress to refund the fines. Mm -hmm. And in history, it's sort of gone down in the books as, as uh, a, a big mistake, something we wouldn't repeat. But it's taken a while, I think, to get to that, that view. That's true, and it's interesting that uh, so soon after uh, the United States was formed, you had this huge challenge to the First Amendment. And you're right, it only went away when John Adams was no longer president. It's not something that was overturned by a court. Um, to be fair to John Adams, actually, let's not be fair to John Adams. Um, <laughs> he was, uh, I think he once said that he supported the press, but that it could be very dangerous. So you already see right there that there's a tense relationship sometimes between the presidency and the media. Um, John, and you know, we all often think of political discourse as being especially outrageous today, but uh, in the time of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, it was pretty outrageous back then, too. There were a lot of insults being hurled. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, it was not till uh, 166 years later, um, Justice William Brennan in the famous libel case of New York Times against Sullivan inserted a paragraph, sort of took the opportunity to say, just in case there's any lingering doubt, now in 1964, let's be clear that the Sedition Act would have violated the First Amendment, hasn't stood the test of history, we don't want to ever go there again. But that was a century and a half later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Actually, Steve, you say that the First Amendment is really just 100 years old for practical purposes. Can, can you explain that? So um, partly what we were talking about a minute ago, that the culture of going to court to defend your constitutional rights really is a, is a kind of a 20th century phenomenon. Um, there, there are many um, free speech controversies in the country in the 1800s that never end up in court or end up in the lowest level of the courts but never get to the Supreme Court. The, um, 
the, the effort in southern states to suppress anti-slavery speech. I mean, there are actually laws in the 1820s, 1830s, punishing um, those who want to abolish slavery for pamphlets and newspapers and, and speech against slavery, which today would seem to be obvious First Amendment issues, mm -hmm. but, but weren't seen that way then. So it's really not until 1917, 1919 that we see the first real First Amendment cases um, bubbling up. And what was the issue there? Uh, in, in World War I, um, the government seemed to be very fearful that anti-draft protests and flyers and literature would actually have a significant impact and, and, and make it difficult for the government to mount an army um, to go fight in World War I. And so they began using the Espionage Act and, and other laws to punish people for encouraging resistance to the draft. When you say they, was that the Wilson administration? Yeah, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the Justice Department was prosecuting people and, uh, and winning those cases. The first, it, it's a fascinating paradox, right, that the, the first half dozen important free speech decisions from the Supreme Court articulate these wonderful foundational principles which don't protect anybody because everybody goes to jail in those cases even though the court is is wrestling with the ideas of what the First Amendment should mean, the protesters are losing, the pamphlet publishers are losing. Right, and I believe this was the case, uh, one of these early cases was where the uh, phrase that you don't have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater was coined, mm -hmm. a phrase that I cannot stand when people use, because if the theater is on fire, you should definitely yell out yeah. fire in the crowded theater. It's a, I think it's an analogy just, that just gets, gets misused so often. Mm -hmm. but, but important in the formation of modern First Amendment law. The other small piece of it is it's important to rem remember that the First Amendment didn't apply to laws passed by the states. It only applied to laws passed by the federal government until about 1925, 1927, when the Supreme Court basically changed its mind about that. There weren't a lot of federal laws that would have been said to encroach on free speech or free press, and so there was not a lot of reason to go to court with those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. And you both argued that it was after that window that the Supreme Court started weighing in on First Amendment cases, cases and really giving definition to it. Um, so let's start with the categories of speech that the court has said are outside the scope of the First Amendment and totally unprotected. What are some examples of that? Well, I like to think the first few are the ones that I, I think of as the obvious ones. As soon as I say them, people are like, oh, of course, right. Um, the First Amendment does not protect perjury, lying under oath. It doesn't protect solicitation of someone else to commit a crime, so you can't hire a hitman and then say that was just free speech. You're negotiating the terms. Um, it doesn't protect child pornography. Um, it, uh, it doesn't protect blackmail. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the category of things that are, that they're a little bit more complicated. Um, it's not gonna protect th true threats on someone else's life or safety. Although what a true threat is, is something that uh, depends on context a lot. It's not always as straightforward as some might imagine. Um, it also doesn't protect um, speech that incites others to immediate violence. Um, and uh, then I think of, uh, there's also the category of, oh, it doesn't protect obscenity. It's mm -hmm. not gonna protect fighting words. That, that's words that are only intended to provoke a violent reaction from someone else. And then you have to think of another category as speech that you can be sued for. Um, it's not going to protect libel, saying false mm -hmm. things about someone else that will damage their reputation. And um, it doesn't protect uh, plagiarized speech or copyright violations. You can still be sued for that. Mm -hmm. And are, were there any particularly interesting cases that illustrate any of these um, uh, areas that are not protected by the First Amendment? Oh, yeah, lots of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, True threats, which I think is a very interesting area. Mm -hmm. um, Watts v. United States is a case that uh, illustrates exactly what a true threat is, as much as you can put an exact definition on that. Because in that case, you had a young man who was protesting the Vietnam War. 
and at a gathering actually on the Washington Mall, a protest, he said that if he was drafted, uh, his first bullet would be headed straight towards LBJ. And he was arrested for threatening the life of the president. And when the Supreme Court heard this case, um, what they found was that you had to look at the statement in context. You couldn't just take it in a vacuum because it was important that he was at a protest, that he was protesting the war, um, that when he said uh, what he said, that his first bullet would be headed towards LBJ, people laughed. They thought of it as a joke. Um, he was not likely to ever be in the vicinity of LBJ. All of that was taken into account when they were evaluating whether it was a true threat or not. Mm -hmm. uh, the incitement standard is sort of the the, the successor to the fire in a theater standard. When the fire in a the theater line was uttered, it was supposed to be the, the clear line, you know, between what was acceptable speech and what was not acceptable speech. Um, in the late 1960s, the court came up with this incitement standard in a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. Uh, and what the court said was, um, the, the speaker that you want to punish for inciting has to intend lawless action and intend that and be in a situation in which there is an imminent likelihood of lawless action. So if you're speaking in front of an angry mob and you're rallying that mob to go do something illegal, go throw a brick through a window, um, you can be punished for incitement. But it, those elements all have to be present. It's a very, it's a very, or intended to be a very speech protective test. If you're, if you're giving a fiery speech in circumstances in which it seems pretty unlikely that anybody is actually going to act on what you're urging them to do, then your speech should be protected. Mm -hmm. So just generally saying that people should rise up one day isn't going to cut right. it. Mm -hmm. So I think you've done a good job of laying out types of um, speech that are not protected by the First Amendment. So let's move on to uh, 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 First Amendment issues that are protected. Uh, you both said that, that the court has created over time a hierarchy of speech values. Can you explain what you mean by that? The, the court has basically, I think, done this in two ways. We were describing whole categories of speech that the court says are outside the First Amendment entirely. Then there's a second set of judgments that the court makes where it says political speech is the most important and, and contributes the most to our dialogue as a democracy. But there are other kinds of speech that are protected but not as important. So commercial speech, advertising, is protected by the First Amendment, but isn't as valuable and so doesn't get as much protection. That's uh, why uh, you can, uh, the government can place more regulations on advertising than, mm -hmm. say, political speech. Mm -hmm. Profanity um, can't be entirely prohibited, except in some circumstances on, on television, but um, it, it's not considered to be of great value, and so it gets even less protection than commercial speech. And so the court has kind of created this ladder of, of free speech values. And how did that evolve? I mean, I, you, you've described it pretty well as a ladder, and there are, you know, there's a hierarchy of it. But were there cases that the, that the court took and decided on that, that made this obvious to scholars such as yourself? Yeah, I mean, take commercial speech, for example. Prior to 1976, roughly, um, commercial speech was thought not to have any First Amendment protection. Um, but beginning in the mid-1970s, the court had a long series of cases lasting about 20 years in which some justices began to say, well, you know, maybe there is some value to commercial speech. Maybe it should be entitled to some First Amendment protection. I think the very first one was... Um, mailing ab advertisements about contraceptives. Uh, there was one about drug prices and one about contraceptives uh, where the court for the first time said, uh, well, you know, maybe this, this deserves some First Amendment protection. It's divided the court deeply over the years. Most of the decisions have been five to four one way or the other. 
<laughs> and over time, the rule has evolved. And it can get tricky. Um, there's another category related to commercial speech. Uh, it's called professional speech, where, um, you know, for instance, uh, you can't just call yourself a doctor in a lot of states. You have to actually meet certain requirements in order to be a doctor. And there are certain things that you, like for lawyers, for instance, um, there are certain uh, things that lawyers have to adhere to when it comes to how they advertise their services, et cetera, which you could think of as a restriction on speech. But it's considered to be an exception because it's professional speech. You're holding yourself out to be a lawyer, and therefore you have to comply with certain standards. And people have challenged that. People have said that it's unfair, that uh, there's this whole category of speech that is sort of left unprotected, and that it can be hard to draw the line between regular speech and professional speech and commercial speech. So it's not without controversy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, the court has also defined how and whether speech is protected, and that depends on a whole lot of considerations. And some of those would be? The, I mean, most of what we've talked about so far is the substance or content of the speech, but there's a whole set of what we might call mechanical rules is is uh, is the speech does the speech involve expressive conduct or is it just expression and no conduct if it involves conduct you have more leeway to regulate if you're the government um, if it's pure speech and not conduct then there's more protection for the speech where does it take place does it take place on government property if it's on government property, the government can impose what the court calls time, place, and manner. I would sort of call them traffic regulations. <laughs> um, That's like if you're having a, uh, a protest, um, the First Amendment protects your right to protest, but the government can put certain restrictions on, say, when you have your protest. Um, they might say you can't have it in the middle of the night because we don't have enough police protection at that time, or you can't have it during rush hour, um, time, place, and manner restrictions. What they can't do is restrict your right to protest based on the content of your, pro of your protest, the content of what you're about to say. Um, they can't discriminate based on that, but they can, say, require you to have a permit in order to perhaps hold your protest. Or mm -hmm. say that there won't be two permits. If Lada wants to protest something and I want to protest something else and she got there first and got the first permit, um, they, they can give me a permit for tomorrow. She's got the one for today mm -hmm. because it's too much to have us both protesting at the same time. Mm -hmm. All right. What other conditions or considerations would there be? Well, um, it's also the courts have also recognized that sometimes the government has a bit more power to regulate speech than other in, than in other situations. And one of those situations is a K through 12 public school has more power to regulate speech than it, the government would in another situation. And that's because, you know, uh, their minors have slightly less in the way of First Amendment rights uh, than adults. And also the school has a duty to uh, provide uh, a safe and good environment for learning. Um, the same thing holds true. The government has a bit more power to regulate speech in prisons, and the government actually has more power to regulate the speech of its own employees. Mm -hmm. And what's an example of that? Of government employee speech? Mm -hmm. um, well, my husband works for the federal government, and so a good example of that would be he has to comply with the Hatch Act, which is something that dictates certain uh, types of political activities that government employees cannot engage in, or uh, cannot engage in at work, or sometimes activities they can never engage in. Um, for instance, they can't uh, solicit uh, political donations um, via their work email addresses or at work. You know, there's like things like that. And part of that is just being a representative of the government. I mean, the, the jargon is if you're a public employee, you can speak about matters of public concern when you're not speaking directly in your job capacity. Um, that's, that's sort of the standard the court has used. What does that mean? It, it means it limits, it limits the free speech of public employees in a lot of ways. You, you may have specific expertise about something that comes from your job experience and where we might think that your participation in a public debate about that issue would be very valuable because you actually know what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's related to your job. Your knowledge comes from your job. The issue is related to your job, you can't do it. 
mm -hmm. unless your employee says employer says so. Mm -hmm. And there have been cases where, um, for instance, police officers have posted things on Facebook that have gotten them fired from their jobs. And you know, when they file suit saying this is a violation of my First Amendment rights, I'm on my, I'm, I was at home and I posted something on Facebook. Um, you know, the judges have, some of them have found that, well, what you posted on Facebook, you know, if it was something racist or controversial or anything, it might implicate your ability to do your job in your community. And so your, it, your, uh, your precinct had the right to fire you. So with government employees, it's not as simple as whether they're in the office or not. There can be a lot of things that are taken into consideration there. Mm -hmm. And there's another category, which is sort of, a, a, it's, it's not newly emerging, but it seems to be newly expanding, and that is the government's own speech. Um, the Supreme Court ruled recently that uh, uh, license plates, what the messages that are on license plates, this was a case from Texas, is actually government speech, not individual speech. And so the government can control um, the content of license plates it gives the government, and we haven't seen a lot of, of evolution of this yet, but it gives the government potentially a lot of power. If the government can label something government speech, mm -hmm. then all the other rules don't apply. The government can discriminate on the basis of viewpoint and content all at once. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, the case was they were government-issued license plates. Mm -hmm. And an individual wanted to put a Confederate flag on their license plate. Mm -hmm. And Texas's state government sa said, no, the license plates are our speech, and we have an interest in not uh, conveying that message on our license plates. And mm -hmm. They won in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting how you can apply that doctrine to different situations. That doctrine was applied to a public park and the monuments that were chosen to be in that park. you know, that, So it can be more pervasive than you might think. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of that is be, when they said to Texas, okay, you can decide whether there's gonna be a Confederate license plate or not. In that particular instance, Texas didn't wanna have a Confederate flag, but the decision basically gave Texas the power to decide. So if Texas tomorrow said, we won't have any U.S. flags on our license plates, but we're going to have Confederate flags on our license plates. It's government speech. Uh, so freedom of speech doesn't just apply to speech. What else does it cover? Oh, um, a lot of different forms of expression. It applies to music, movies, computer games. Um, some might say it applies to computer code. Still an open question, but mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to see how it's expanded. Um, it applies to online content. Um, there was a decision last year called Packingham v. North Carolina that said it applies to social media. That is a free speech right, your right to post on social media. Mm -hmm. um, it will eventually expand to cover uh, virtual reality in cities on the moon or wherever we're gonna be living in like 100 years because that's the great thing actually about freedom of speech, about the First Amendment. It expands with the times. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the earlier cases about uh, freedom of speech involving something other than speech? I mean, oh. What's really interesting versus is Des Moines, that, I guess, is <laughs> the famous one. Right. But, um, oh yeah, I mean, so interestingly enough, movies, when they first came out, um, they were not recognized to be a form of, of speech they needed to protect. It. They needed to be protected. They were censored heavily mm -hmm. um, because, honestly, they weren't thought of as like a, a real medium to express ideas and thoughts. They were just thought of as uh, this salacious new form of entertainment. So actually recognizing entertainment as a form of speech is something that took a while to come about. And you mentioned Tinker v. Des Moines, which is a case where students wore black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. And that's something else that is covered by freedom of speech, symbolic speech, burning a flag or flashing a peace sign or things like that. These are also considered to be speech. Mm -hmm. And it also covers the right not to speak, as in the right not to say the Pledge of Allegiance or not to sing the national anthem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting questions there that I think the Supreme Court has skirted a little bit is, to what degree do we have to know what you're intending to say and what your message was? And the court has sort of said that we do, but not maybe not as clearly as they as they might, or maybe maybe they shouldn't. I mean, there was a case called Spence versus Washington where Spence um, stitched a, an upside down peace symbol on the American flag and hung it out his window and somebody went after him for defacing the American flag, um, and the 
courts, the court said, you know, it's, it seems as though there is a message that he is trying to express and that therefore this ought to be protected expression. But it was a, I don't know what his message was. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of an ambiguous thing, mm -hmm. you know. So how much, how much do we have to know about what you're trying to express? Or is it enough that you say, I was intending to express a message? Mm -hmm. How does it apply to music? Do you have some examples of that? Well, I mean, go ahead. Um, so music is a, it's as a form of artistic expression. Um, so the First Amendment will protect the government from censoring your speech or punishing you for your speech. So it's not going to apply if, say, um, Walmart refuses to, co cover, uh, to carry your album for whatever reason. That's People don't really carry albums much anymore, but you know, it, it doesn't apply to private companies or organizations deciding not to sell your album. It would apply more, like for instance, um, government-funded art grants denying them to like a certain type of music or art because it, it doesn't express a point of view that you want or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of artistic expression, that's kind of where that would come into play. There have been obscenity prosecutions against um, bands or, or rap groups um, uh, saying that their their creations violated the obscenity standards. Um, most of those have not worked out very well for the government. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the speech has been found to be protected more often than not. And let's talk a little bit about online content and social media because it is so interesting and Lata, I know you uh, you gave us a slide about some of the issues that come up vis-a-vis uh, -vis online content that maybe you could talk through. Sure. Um, so, interestingly enough, uh, it wasn't a given that the First Amendment would apply to content that's posted online. That's something um, we just celebrated uh, the was it the 20th anniversary of a case called Reno v. ACLU, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, when the Supreme Court said, yes, this applies to the internet, and regulations, uh, this, it was a challenge of a regulation that said that was meant to protect children from uh, inappropriate content, but the Supreme Court, very ahead of its time here, uh, looked at that and realized that that could just limit the content on the internet altogether, and part of the reason that the internet is the complete free-for-all that we, we all know and resent but also enjoy is because of that, because they realized that to place regulations on the speech just because it was online could be very damaging towards this mode of communication. So you see that in the content that's posted online. You see that with the, the content on social media, um, that there isn't so much regulation or government regulation of what you can say. The interesting thing is that now that uh, a lot of the internet is dominated by these huge private companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter, they have their own restrictions they place on content sometimes, and they have the right to do that because they're private companies. Although that does, you know, even though it's not a First Amendment issue, it still kind of raises the issue of is this limiting free speech since so much of our public discourse takes place online nowadays. Mm -hmm. And the case that Lada mentioned earlier, the Packingham case, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy has what I think is the most profound statement by the court to date of the importance of social media in our society and the role it plays in our in our ability to communicate and interact with each other. And the, 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 the court, I think, has done a good job of understanding that but hasn't articulated that idea so well until this decision last, last spring, which I think is maybe the broadest statement of um, you know, social media has become our, our our marketplace, our forum. It's we don't we don't go to the town square anymore mm -hmm. to to express ourselves. We we go to the internet. We go to Twitter, and and so the the, the beginning of the court recognizing the, the importance of that, I think, is is significant. Mm -hmm. Can you share what Kennedy said? Do you, can you? I don't remember the exact <laughs> quote. Sorry. Uh, I, I will say that something that's very noteworthy is that he saw the importance of social media to free speech, not just being able to post your own thoughts on social media, but mm -hmm. people often forget that the, uh, the First Amendment, the right to free speech, also includes your right to hear speech and your mm -hmm. right to be part of this public conversation to receive, in, to receive information, which is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was actually a tough case. This was a convicted sex offender who had served his time was required to register 
forever as a sex offender, but part of the sentence was that he was going to be he was uh, involved in child sex offenses. He was going to be barred forever from accessing any sites, Twitter, Facebook, internet, anywhere where there might be children present. And the court struck that down and said it was too broad because it prohibited his access to this essential means of communication in our society today. Mm -hmm. And you both are um, teach at American University, um, LATA on an adjunct basis, I guess, and Steve, full-time professor. Why don't you share some of the conversations that you have with your students about the First Amendment and, uh, and uh, free speech? It's, uh, it, it's challenging, um, I have to say. Um, I think that students today don't necessarily have as much appreciation as I might wish they did of um, the free exchange of ideas, the, uh, you know, the, the basic principles of that New York Times versus Sullivan opinion that we we're committed to, to open and robust uh, debate and that we recognize that it, sometimes it might be hurtful and caustic and, and damaging, but that that's the price we pay in it and to have a democracy. I don't always find that students appreciate that value. I think students increasingly today maybe want to hear what they want to hear and not hear what they don't. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, but I also think that Maybe I just take a cynical view of humanity as a whole, but I think everyone has a tendency to love the First Amendment until they don't. You know, everybody has, everybody believes that their own speech should be protected. And most people do have a point where they're like, well, not his speech, his speech is terrible. Mm -hmm. So I think that's common among students, also common among adults from my experience. It's just sort of a, in a, in a way, I think it's only natural that we're all like a little bit hypocritical about free speech. We all we all have a point where we really would rather not hear it or rather not read it. And uh, you know, I guess in a way that binds us all that uh, we all have our, our limits. But at the end of the day, um, you have to remember that if you enforce your limits and everybody else enforces their limits, I think we were talking about this earlier. There's not a lot of speech left. Right. <laughs> I mean, I haven't experienced, and I would imagine you have not either some of the horror stories that you read about where um, professors are engaged in what they think is a, is a lecture or an exchange of ideas and they say something that perhaps they don't even realize offended somebody and they're, uh, somebody, a student who's offended complains to the administration about some allegedly inappropriate comments made by faculty members or by other students and you end up with a whole you know, ju judicial proceeding, disciplinary hearings, and so on. I, I, I've not experienced that, fortunately, and and uh, and hopefully won't, because I would find it very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the First Amendment has been back in um, in the theater, as it were, uh, with the movie called The Post, which is a movie about the Pentagon Papers. What lessons do you think the public is learning or relearning re about the First Amendment from um, what the Post and the Times went through? I, you know, I, I think that maybe reactions to the movie are kind of self-reinforcing. Um, maybe it's my narrow world, but I don't travel with a lot of people who uh, think the First Amendment is useless or meaningless or goes too far. I guess most of the people I hang out with have some appreciation of the First Amendment. So those people tend to love the movie because mm -hmm. it captures very dramatically uh, the, the commitment to being able to publish and disseminate information even when the government doesn't want you to, or especially when the government doesn't want you to. I don't know what other people think about it. I don't know whether <laughs> If you, if you walk into the theater with a skeptical view of the press, if you've been affected, for example, by the president's attacks on the press, and you go to see this movie, does it change your view and give you a greater appreciation of freedom of the press? Or do you come out saying, wow, how could they have published that stuff? They were hurting the country. I don't know. I mean, uh, so at the First Amendment Center, we do a survey every year. It's called the State of the First Amendment Survey. 
And uh, last year we asked people, um, you know, do you think that journalists should be allowed to publish leaked information? And you know, a lot of people were like, no, that's that that is illegal or should be illegal. And um, I think one thing that the Post does well is that when you follow the the route that the Washington Post took, um, you see that you know, I, by the end when they're at the judicial decision, the they see you, you can learn that the press is considered so important that the standard is immediate irreparable harm. You can't the government can't restrain the press from printing something unless it would cause immediate irreparable harm to the United States and. Um, I'm glad that the movie strives to educate people about that standard. Although, I will say personally, like one of the stories about that entire um, situation, the Pentagon Papers, what I find really interesting is that a lot of the justices who ruled on it actually thought, okay, the um, the New York Times and the Washington Post publishing these these papers, these leaked Pentagon Papers, that would harm the United States. That might be terrible for the United States. But ultimately, they decided it doesn't rise to that really high bar of immediate and irreparable and so we have to allow it. I think that's I think that's a really important story. I hope somebody tells that story too. Um, yeah. just because it just shows that um, you you weigh these things and ultimately like in, except in very, very drastic circumstances, the press usually comes out on top. And I think that just reflects um, the value that this country has placed in the idea of the press serving as a watchdog on the government. Mm -hmm. So that's something that happened almost 50 years ago, which is hard to hard to believe um, that it was that long ago. Uh, we had a more recent example, uh, the, the book about the Trump administration, Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury. Uh, the president and his lawyer sought to halt publication of the book. Any thoughts on how that would have played out if it had gone anywhere or? So in, in one important legal sense, they raise the same issue, which is that a fundamental tenet of our First Amendment um, decision making is that you, you courts should not issue what are called prior restraints. Mm -hmm. Prior restraint is basically saying um, we're going to stop you from from being able to publish or speak or disseminate information. Our system operates on the idea that you speak, you publish, if you've broken a law by doing that, we can punish you and we'll debate whether the First Amendment ought to protect what you did in the course of your defending yourself. But the ultimate form of government censorship is a prior restraint. You're giving the government the power to say, no, you can't speak, no, you can't publish. And so uh, it, it should have been a no-brainer, I think, to the president's lawyers um, that they were not going to be able to go to the publisher and say you can't publish Fire and Fury uh, because the president doesn't want it to be published or, or doesn't or, or thinks it might be harmful to his presidency. It mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, and Lata, did you want to describe a little bit more about the it's some more information from the First Amendment survey? I know you've been doing this for a number of years. Are there any trends that journalists should be aware of in those findings? Well, uh, yeah, the survey has been performed for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, a trend that we tend to see is that around a time um, when there has been a uh, an incident like 9-11 or the Boston Marathon bombings, people tend to be uh, less supportive of First Amendment rights. People are more likely to say that they think those rights go too far. But um, it usually adjusts after a sufficient amount of time has passed and people go back to being supportive of First Amendment rights. So that's not exactly um, earth shattering that people tend to, uh, when they think national security is at risk, they tend to be less, less supportive of free speech, which is unfortunate, but um, it's just a reality of it. The other thing that uh, I found interesting about this past year's survey is that we were able to look at the results um, with a partisan breakdown, and it's it breaks out the way that you would think, that people who are conservative-leaning, um, they, they tended to think that journalists shouldn't be able to publish leaked information, um, you know, they, 
tended to have views that uh, they tended to think it was okay to use religion, for instance, as something, as a criteria on whether somebody should be able to immigrate or not. And then people who lean liberal tended to think that it would be, it should be okay to ban campus speakers and things like that, or ban hate speech on social media. And it just kind of goes back to that I think that everybody kind of dislikes the First Amendment when it uh, when it's speech that they don't support. And I, I think that while that's not surprising, it was interesting just to be aware of just how great that tendency is. Mm -hmm. And was there any kind of trend line based on age, younger people versus middle aged versus older? Um, in, cer in certain areas, uh, I. I think that younger people, uh, when it came to speech on so social media, they thought that um, they were more likely to be in favor of censoring, censoring certain types of speech. So you do, you do see that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of cases pending before the Supreme Court right now that deal with free speech issues. So why don't we talk about a few of those? And not directly free press cases, but but for free speech, I think it's the the heaviest docket of First Amendment cases maybe the Supreme Court has ever had in a in a single term. There are actually five different um, free speech cases pending right now. Um, I'm happy to pick one and start or uh, we can we can take turns. Well, what's uh, your favorite? <laughs> it's got to be Masterpiece, masterpiece. Right? But go ahead. Do you want to do, do that one? <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot to unpack in that one, but I think that was I want to say the the most controversial um, First Amendment and one of the more controversial cases period that the Supreme Court heard this term. Um, the case being, and this goes, it, it's a very perfect example of what you were saying when you said that you uh, differentiate between speech and conduct. Because um, in this case, you had a baker who was you know, uh, quite well known for producing these elaborate custom wedding cakes, and he re he refused to make one for a gay couple's wedding. And you know, the uh, Colorado has a law that says you can't discriminate and you can't refuse services based on someone's race, gender, sexuality, etc. Um, so the question kind of became, and there's there's quite a few questions here, but one of them is this baker's custom wedding cakes. Is that an act of speech, like an artistic expression? Because if it is, then you can't compel somebody to speak. You can't compel somebody to make a piece of art. On the other hand, if you think of it as conduct, if it's a service, if it's just like refusing to serve someone in your restaurant, if that's, if that's analogous to refusing to make them a cake, then that's conduct and you can compel that. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And um, you had First Amendment advocates on both sides of the case Lots of amicus briefs were submitted for that, um, so it, it's uh, it'll be really interesting to see how it turns out. Second favorite, <laughs> um, I guess my second favorite is is the case from California about just because I think it's so interesting. The California has a law that says that family planning clinics, which basically in practice translates to anti-abortion pro-life clinics that don't want to tell people about abortion. Under California law, they actually have to post information in their clinic in a prominent place telling people where they can get abortion services and get information about abortions. And uh, several of the clinics have sued to challenge that law, basically in a sense same argument as the, as the baker that it's compelled speech, that the government is telling them that they have to display a particular message that is contrary to their view and contrary to their message. Can the government of California do that as a public safety and, and health measure that you're misleading people by not having them have access to abortion information? Or does it violate the free speech rights of the clinics? Uh, because they are being compelled to make statements that are contrary to their views. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. And what about the t-shirt case from Minnesota? That's an interesting one. Right, that's a challenge to uh, Minnesota law that says that you can't have, um, well, you can't wear or assumably post or, or hold up garments with political speech um, within a certain vicinity of a polling booth. And so you are restricting speech within the vicinity of the polling booth. The 
rationale being that this will influence the election in some way and that you want to keep uh, partisan speech away from the polling booth. But, you know, I mean, the challenge, I, I, I think the challenge is based on a pretty understandable principle that somebody wearing a T-shirt near the polling booth does not necessarily um, imperil the process of democracy. And what did the T-shirt say? What did the T-shirt say? Was, uh, he was a Tea Party advocate. He was, mm -hmm. so his T-shirt was, was basically a Tea Party T-shirt, and then he was actually, if I remember right, was advocating in favor of voter ID laws. So he had a button that was pro-voter ID laws and a T-shirt that said support the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. um, and, and both of them were contrary to the rule in, in under Minnesota law. Um, but he says, you know, a polling place in, in, in a polling place is not a speech-free zone. Um, I have a right to express myself in a polling place like I have a right to express myself anyplace else. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll look for rulings on those cases in the coming months. So um, because our audience is primarily journalists, we'd like to ask uh, speakers to, if they could uh, mention some resources that would be useful to journalists on First Amendment or free speech issues. Um, I feel a little bad about plugging this, but I believe that the First Amendment Center's website at the Museum Institute has a huge number of resources for, for journalists about the background behind freedom of the press laws, freedom of speech laws. Um, there's so many good, good resources. Um, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists also has a lot of great online resources. Since you can't be objective about the First Amendment Center, I'll recommend the First Amendment Center <laughs> website. Too. That's a great resource. Oh, thank you. Um, for the current cases that we were just talking about, SCOTUS blog mm -hmm. um, has a page for every case that the court is is hearing and deciding. So you can find uh, you know a case with background, a page with background and commentary and copies of all the petitions and briefs in all of those currently pending First Amendment cases. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press um, uh, monitors a lot of uh, cases involving the media, and, uh, more specifically, and not just broadly First Amendment, but, but media-related more specifically. So I think that's a useful place to go as well. All right, any final thoughts? Um, I, you know, we're in a, as you said at the outset, I think we're in a period of great First Amendment turmoil, uh, particularly about the rights of the press and the media to, to be able to report freely and the, the credibility of the press and the media being under attack. Um, I, I want to believe that we have built uh, a substantial enough kind of bulwark of, of, of free speech and free press that um, it will, will, will come out okay on the other side, even in this period of, of, um, of kind of great questioning of the credibility of the media and, and questioning of the value of free speech. Well, and I hope so. Well, uh, I guess this isn't specifically aimed at journalists, although that's, that's very well put. Um, I think that the first step to protecting your rights is knowing that you have them and understanding them. So I guess my final thought would be um, to educate yourself about them. I mean, I think that we've seen uh, lately that civic education um, is not that common anymore in the United States, and a lot of Americans are and I don't mean this with any judgment, but a lot of Americans are ignorant about how our government works and how their rights work. And I understand, you know, everyone's busy, but this, it's just crucial to understand these rights because they, they provide us with so much. And just knowing how they work is such an important thing today. Well, great. So our thanks again to Lata Knott of the museum's First Amendment Center and American University law professor Stephen Ramil. Resources from this webinar will be posted for your use on MPF's website at nationalpress.org, where we make good journalists better.